Okay, well, welcome everyone and thanks for joining us for our annual webinar on making the most of college tours. A couple of housekeeping notes. Uh, first off, we will be recording this webinar and sharing with that recording as well as um, these materials and our guide to college tours tomorrow uh, in a follow up email and then please feel free to share with us any questions you have. Um, I think everybody's sort of an old pro on um, on Zoom, but the Q&A box is there for you to share any questions you have, and we'll try to answer it if it's sort of a broad question. If not, we'll follow up one-on-one. -on -one. But again, thanks for taking some time out of your busy day to join us. And yes, I'm so glad that you guys are here. I'm Lisa Carlton, the CEO of College Matchpoint. And I have the great pleasure of introducing our team today, which I'm super excited about for this webinar because we have um, Bob and I, who are almost always on the webinars. Also on our team, we have Claudia Salinas, who comes from the admissions side of the world prior to joining College Matchpoint. So she's been at Harvey Mudd, Rochester, Cornell, Rice, so a lot of um, variety of colleges. So she really brings a lot to the table here today. And we also have Dr. Michael Weinstein, who has come from the faculty side of the college world. And so that, I think that gives us, Michael's taught at Michigan, Yale, Harvard. So it gives us some real breadth today in terms of thinking about how to explore colleges and think about them. We really want this to be a conversation. So please join in with questions and we're excited to talk to you guys today and appreciate your time. Thanks, Lisa. Um, since Lisa uh, founded College Match Point 13 years ago, we've worked with students who've been admitted to hundreds of schools and maybe toured over a thousand different schools. Um, college tours are sort of a mainstay of a student's journey to college and of a junior year experience for so many families. Our discussion this afternoon is going to start with a little bit of table setting around college lists. Um, we're going to dive into how students uh, can make the most of campus tours, and then we're going to talk a little bit about the phenomenon that is demonstrating interest beyond a college tour for a student. So a college list impact on a campus tour. Let's start with a little bit of context from the pandemic, which like so many other things really impacted list building, building a college list. During the pandemic, the average list size, these numbers are reported by the Common App, which is the platform that many students apply to a number of different colleges. The average list size for students applying to colleges increased by about an average of one and the number of applications grew. Overall, they grew 9%. I think it's fair to say in the great state of Texas, they exploded. Um, this year versus last year, there was a 40% increase in the number of applications submitted by students in the state of Texas. <clears throat> As a result, college admissions has become more competitive at some schools and at some majors. Uh, in our last webinar, we spent a fair amount of time talking about those selective colleges and majors. And today, for the most part, we'll be talking about the broad universe of colleges. Um, uh, uh, COVID really did increase anxiety and uncertainty. There are so many different reasons for that. Both the difficult experience students had, the anxiety about how colleges will be evaluating students, and the uncertainty about whether or not you'd even be able to see a school in some cases before you decide whether or not to go there. Delayed college visits have really challenged students to figure out if their initial criteria is actually the final criteria they want to have, the final set of priorities they want to focus on in terms of their college list. Um, last spring, we had a great webinar about test standardized testing trends with um, Jed Appleruth. His analysis is that the air quotes of test optional are important to understand that while so many schools have the policy, in truth, 
Test scores have come back as an important input for many students. And then finally, students have really struggled for a variety of reasons in finalizing what their major choice would be, will be at schools that prioritize that choice. We want to um, always communicate to students who are on today's webinar and to parents that the key to the journey to college is that a student ends up at a school they'll thrive in. The focus is on what they do, not simply on where they go. And there is a breadth of options for students. We always encourage them to manage their college list with an eye towards options. Even if they start the process with a dream school or one school that they've always thought they'd attend, that they were raised burnt orange, or they always thought they'd go to BU or Stanford, that's great. There's no problem with that. But bring that passion along in your ability to build what some of our colleagues refer to as a wise college list, a college list that provides students with options, a college list that gives them opportunities. Now, what does it mean to develop a college list? As we said before, we believe that the foundation of every college list is a student's criteria, not what everyone else wants in their college list not what mom and dad want, not what their consultant or counselor wants, but what is the student's criteria? What is she focusing on? What do they want in the classroom, on campus, and the surrounding community? And for families that are on today who have ninth or 10th graders, we always find this changes from freshman year to junior year, and for parents and juniors who are on this call, it typically changes from fall of junior year to the summer between junior and senior year. It's supposed to change. The more you research schools, the more you're, we're hoping you'll get a sense of what kind of school you want to go to. The other thing that we always suggest to students is that that breadth of options is not just acceptance level. Um, some people refer to them as reach, possible, match, wild card. Um, I joke with students that you don't just want to start by thinking about where to go to eat dinner at the most expensive restaurant in town. You really need to start with the possible restaurants in town. Um, we also think that families ought to consider location, size, and for many families, at least consider the relative cost of college in terms of both the total cost, but also the cost after potential merit or need-based aid. Now, we found historically over the last 13 years that the best college lists in the world are college lists that the student owns, that they drive. Um, students oftentimes have really strongly held opinions about a car that a parent might buy from them, even about a guitar or another instrument, oftentimes even a computer or a backpack. Students, we encourage you to have more opinions about the college that your parents will pay for than this, the car or the computer they purchased for you. And parents, we encourage you to be open to shifts, changes. Students who start by thinking they want to go to a large public university and end up deciding that that small private liberal arts school is exactly where I think I can thrive. Now, what do we mean by this idea of a balanced college list? Now, it's not a one size fits all. This may vary for different students. But we generally see sort of uh, on average that a student applying to college will end up in the summer before their senior year with two to three reaches, five to seven possibles, and two to three matches. We don't call them safety schools anymore. Uh, we don't live in an era of safety schools. And those schools that students might statistically refer to as safety schools Oftentimes, students just put them on their list because an adult has encouraged them to put those schools on their list. They have no interest in that list. Our baseline for students is only apply to schools that you actually want to go to. 
Don't use a slot on your list for a school that at the end of the day you wouldn't go to. And then finally, one of the things we've seen during the pandemic is that many students who are focused on highly selective schools, students who tend to be either highly ranked at their high school and or having an extraordinary background or skill or talent, they've tended to expand the number of reach schools they have, oftentimes having four to five reach schools, um, sometimes either six or seven. We do caution students, if you expand your list to include a larger number of reaches, make sure it's not at the cost of possibles. Make sure it's not in a situation where your list is one possible and 11 reaches. That creates a really challenging January and February of your senior year when you have only a few choices to make. Lisa, before we turn our attention to making the most of college tours, any comments on the college list itself? No, I think, I think you covered it. Thanks. Great. Um, uh, we do want to remind everyone, if you have questions that as we go along, please feel free to share them in the Q&A box. We'll cover them as we go. And if we think it's a topic that we may want to expand and talk more broadly, we'll absolutely do that. So let's talk now about the actual college tours. That's what you guys are here for, but it's so important to get that front end information about college lists. And as we talk about campus tours, I'll integrate in why I think that piece of information is critical in planning your tours. So a few things, as Bob mentioned, a lot of things have changed during the pandemic and a few things are still in place this year. So I wanna start with, you know, kind of pro tips for this year because we are seeing some difficulty this year in terms of tours. Number one is plan early. If you haven't planned for spring break to get tours, it may be hard to still get tours. We're finding that many of our families are finding it difficult for space because colleges are limiting the number of tours. The other thing I'm seeing, and I, had a, I was with a student today where this happened, is that we're seeing that Colleges are just constantly changing this right now as the CDC changes things, as we just have a lot of moving pieces. So you want to make sure before you plan a trip that you've actually got your tour set up with the school. If you can't do that, you might try to meet um, students at that school. Um, but ideally, you want to try to take official tours. And I'm going to talk more about this, but if you are going to go and visit without official tours because you couldn't get them, you definitely want to do a virtual session before you do that. And I'll talk a little bit more about that as we go along. So how else has the um, pandemic impacted college tours? I think this is really important is that um, in the class of 2022, they, we were down 20% from where we were in the pre-pandemic time on tours. Why does that matter? Because what Bob said, students are having a harder time making college decisions absent seeing real colleges, right? So this is you know, a very real problem. The number of students attending college fairs is down. The number of students meeting with reps is down. This is important because these activities help students take what they think they're going to like in a college and try it on, right? And so this is a real problem and one that I think, although it is more complicated, I am want to say to all of you who are here today, kudos to you, because I think it's still really important. I think getting your student actually connected to the real college and not just reading it in a book or on a website is very important. One of the things that you have an opportunity for right now that I want to highlight because I think it's really going to, I think probably what's going to work out with this class is that you're going to do a lot of virtual opportunities to kind of look out on the landscape and see what's resonating. And then you're going to have to make choices about where to go after you do that. So virtual opportunities is 
where you go on the college's admissions website. That's also where you sign up for a real in-person tour, but they'll highlight the things that they're offering virtually. We're especially interested in things that you have to sign up for. The reason for that is, and Claudia is gonna to speak to this later in the presentation, but demonstrated interest, which is how you show a college that you're genuinely interested in them, is tracked whenever you sign up for something. And so if you're just walking along a campus and no one knows you're there, you learned something, but they didn't know you're there. So you're not getting any, any credit for that. They didn't ever know you were there. They didn't know you were interested. It's like if someone, you know, you know, looks at your picture, but never calls you, you know, like it's, it's, that's, you know, you want to show the interest really important. The thing that we're seeing that's really cool is we're seeing colleges do a lot of interesting things on the virtual opportunities. So sometimes you're able to even dig deeper in the virtual opportunities than you are if you went on campus, okay? Because we're also seeing at certain campuses, like I was, another student I was meeting with today was telling me she toured campuses, but she couldn't actually go in any buildings, right? It was all outside. So then, you know, you might be able to have more opportunity. We're also seeing things where they're highlighting certain departments and things like that. So you really want to start, I think right now, the way the landscape is with virtual opportunities. One question that I have gotten from parents repeatedly of my clients is, do these matter? Like, do these virtual opportunities matter? And so I'm gonna throw that to Claudia, our, our former um, admissions person. Claudia, would you say that the virtual opportunities that colleges are actually taking them seriously? Absolutely. I think this really presented an opportunity for colleges and universities to have a greater reach to more populations. So this has been a really a wealth of investment by institutions, especially for students who may not be located nearby that school. So if you are located on the West Coast, but you can't seem to make your way to Midwestern or East Coast schools, this is a way that you're able to get more information and really have a touch point with that school. So this has been a place where Colleges are learning a lot about the content that students want, but they are doing and making a lot of effort to make this very relevant for students and to make it useful. So I think it's a wonderful way for, for students to really have a little bit more access to the schools. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think one thing we have noticed is that as this has gone on a little bit, the early ones were pretty weak, I have to be honest, but they've gotten a lot better. And we were at our, the other day, we were like looking at, at a lot of the colleges and what they're doing. It really is great. So I want, I want to encourage you to start with the virtual, because I think it can also save you some money by um, letting you kind of hone it in. And some of our families have done things like done this as just like, as if you were going to tour together, like one I had a family last year that like got popcorn and like really did it up with these and made it fun. So I encourage you, it's a way for you guys to get involved together as you look at the colleges. And this is just some more virtual, there's virtual college fairs, there's, there's quite a lot going on. So that's kind of step one is to, to start there. You know, um, a few years back, I was interviewed about, you know, why should you go visit colleges? Maybe we should just do this virtual thing and not go visit any colleges. But what I would say about that is that this is a really big investment of money you're about to make, right? And I can't think of any investment that you would make at this amount and not do a little bit of research, right? And so I think it's really important to, um, to spend the money to go see some colleges. And what I think is important is to give the student a sense of the different types of colleges that are out there, some different flavors. They're probably not going to see them all this year. I'm pretty sure of that given the state of of touring right now, but I do think it is when we think about the financial side of this, it is important to, to get out there and, and kind of become good consumers of colleges. And I think that's hard to do absent visiting. So touring is also helpful because we're talking to students, you know, I do have been doing this every day for the last 15 years. And one thing has not changed is that students come to this process 
with they what uh, they hear everyone talking about. So if I ask a student in a first meeting, what colleges are you interested in? All I'm really hearing is either what their friends or their parents or their grandparents or someone said about college. It may be a little bit from them, but typically students, you know, in the 10th grade haven't really started, you know, digging in deep to colleges. So this gives them the chance to try it on in the real and like you know um a student said to me today about a tour that she just went on oh my gosh they had tiny libraries and what and she started just talking and i was like oh she loves cozy little spaces like that's really important to her you know she didn't really care about sports like a lot of things that like i already knew she didn't care about sports but i kind of got more about that when she actually could talk about a real college so it tries it on i also think it reveals priorities you know i think in your initial set of college visits variety is great because that's what helps us define what we like this isn't in the presentation but i think it's so important for to point out is that what a student doesn't like is equally, if not more important than what they do like. And I think sometimes we think it's a fail if they go and see a college that they didn't like. I actually think it's a win because then you've defined it. You know, we've got 3000 or more colleges to start with. We're trying to narrow down to find that perfect fit for your student. And I think not, it is not a fail if you visit some colleges that they just say, I hated that. The trick is to get at why they hated it. That's that's where the secret sauce is. So take the time to reflect on what was it? You know, because sometimes it's really surprising. Like, oh, I didn't like because it seemed like it'd be hard to get around or find my way. Or it's not always the obvious. So um, as parents, I really encourage you on those trips to ask a lot of questions, not to jump to what it was for you, but to dig in and ask some reflective questions to help the student get at what it is that, that they're thinking. Now, a few things that I think are really important in planning for college, I'm gonna ask Michael to jump in, in because as I said, Michael has been a professor on a number of college campuses. And so I thought his um, kind of experience in this would be really helpful for us. Yeah, thank you. Um... I mean, there is so much that students can consider in advance of going on a college tour as well. And we've really found that those students who kind of put themselves in the driver's seat of the college research process end up feeling more empowered and also more satisfied and you know more able to thrive in the college they end up in because they go on the tours feeling like they have some sense of what they're focusing on, you know, what they're looking for. So in terms of thinking about criteria, you know, we already talked about the size of the college. Do you want a small liberal arts school with 2000 people? Do you want a big state university like UT Austin, right? These are sort of obvious questions, but I also think that parents and students can have some conversations in advance of college visits about the kind of environment that students think they want. So for example, do you care a lot about being in a place with a lot of academic rigor, where the library is like a hub of the social life of the school, right? Do you want to be tailgating and going to football games and have that sort of, you know, all American uh, sports culture at your school? Do you want fr uh, fraternities and sororities? On the academic side too, we try to empower students at College of Match Point to think about how they learn best, you know, and what's engaging for them. So I would have students think about, you know, do you like large lecture classes where the teacher does like 75% of the talking? Do you want to be super hands-on and be in a lab or, you know, making something or doing a business proposal or, you know, not just having sort of book learning, so to speak? Um, do you like class discussions? Do you want to be on a liberal campus, a conservative campus? And also, do you care about certain lifestyle, you know, things or amenities that the campus needs to have, like um, you know, a Latinx Students Association or um, gender neutral housing or vegan options in the dining hall. You know what I mean? All of these questions can help you think about what you're looking for before you ever go on the tour. So I think doing that research up front is super important. And the one thing I would add to that is um, thinking about majors in advance. So one thing that was interesting for me uh, teaching at universities, often teaching freshmen, is how often the freshmen would show up to college 
not really getting what a major is, you know, or what's involved in declaring a certain major. And especially now when we have a lot of students applying to what we call impacted majors, like hyper competitive ones like business or engineering, it's really important that students take the time to delve into what that major would entail for them, like what's actually involved in, you know, majoring in finance. And a lot of times students are surprised to be like, wait a minute, I need to take 24 credits of advanced math, you know, to be an accounting major. And it's like, yeah, you do. So it's important to look into this. And the way I would advise students to do that is um, if you go to a university's website, there is almost always along the toolbar on the top or on the side, going to be something you can click on that says academics. Sometimes it says departments and programs. You click on that and usually there will be a whole web page that's undergraduate courses of study. Sometimes it's broken down by school, like School of Communications, School of Engineering, whatever it may be. If you click on that, you can see a couple things that I would direct students to. Number one, you can see the curriculum, the requirements for that major. You can also see if there are interdisciplinary majors or minors or like other ways to study things you're interested in that don't go under the name that you went in thinking you were going to study. So for example, you could find that the School of Communications at a given university has a bunch of marketing classes. Um, so if you're into social media marketing, for example, you might not need to go through business school or you might not need to see the word marketing to find that. So look at those department pages and see what they offer. Lastly, I would say, uh, look at the um, outline, sort of the flow chart of the requirements for that major. And sorry, one more thing, there's usually a list of faculty. If you have a student who's interested in research, especially, um, or in researching a certain part of an issue, like I want to study sociology, but it's because I'm interested in helping to mitigate homelessness, for example, look at the faculty, see what they study. When you write your college essay about why you want to go to that school in that major, you are going to be so prepared to say the faculty study the impacts of housing prices on homelessness in Austin, and you're studying that and I want to make an impact on that. And that is a really good way to make an impression on a college as well. To piggyback on what Michael said, one other comment about looking at faculty members, we oftentimes see students who are planning to major in computer science really have a keen eye on the faculty member to make sure that there are faculty members at that school who specialize in the area of programming or in data analytics that the student is interested in. So how are you going to prep? You know, we just talked a little bit about you're going to do research. You're going to visit the college's website, jot down some notes of the things that we're talking about so that you've actually done your homework. I am shocked, also another financial thing, of how many students go on college trips and we parents take them on these trips and we don't require them to do this research. They need, they will get so much out of this trip if they do some research. Maybe you guys wanna talk about it one night at dinner or something so that it's, you know, a group, for, you know, but I do think it is critical. Also jot down the name of the admissions rep for your area. So for example, if you are in Austin, go ahead and put that name down so that you know it. Super, gonna be super important down the road. Now, how do you actually, this is a question I get all the time. So if you know this, I apologize, but it's such a common question. I decided to just like give you guys the walkthrough. You're gonna to go to the college's website. You're gonna to go to admissions. You're then going to go to visit us. They're going to ask you, well, they're gonna have their virtual options a lot now too, but you wanna actually visit the campus. They're normally offering two things. I mean, really large universities are gonna offer more, but. They typically are going to offer a campus tour that's a student led tour and then they're also going to offer you a um, information session which tells like how to apply to their school and maybe some new things that are coming up. Most of the time you are going to register for tours on the website like what percentage like a lot like most everybody so you're going to do this online. Then if you're going to smaller schools and you have some other needs, um, you can call admissions to say, see, like if it's 
a small to say mid-sized private school, you might be able to sit in on a class or if you wanted to meet with a coach or a departmental visit, any of those things you could call admissions. Now that does not mean you can for sure do that, but it certainly does not hurt to try. We've had pretty good luck with our students getting to sit in on classes at quite a few schools and that has been a great win for them. So if that's possible, but that's what you would call for, but you're gonna sign up online. So what makes a great campus tour? I think a few things. I think visiting when students are in session, if we can. Now I get this question all the time and I, we, Bob and I have children and we have taken kids to see colleges when they weren't in session, confession done. So it, sometimes you have to do that. But in a perfect world, we're not doing an architecture tour, we're doing a community tour, right? So seeing it with students, it's really gonna come alive a lot more. I really love campus tours, you know, student-led campus tours, and you should be aware they're a marketing tool, right? So be a good consumer, go on the marketing piece. And also remember that that one student doesn't represent everyone at that college. I'll, so many times students will come back and tell me, I didn't like the tour guide. Well, the tour there, how many people are at this college? Like what else? So I really encourage you to set time to visit with current students if you can, take some pictures, if you can eat in the dining hall, if you can visit the library, if you can sit in on a class, if you can, um, I like to sit in the student center and just watch students. I, I mean, I'm known to just walk right up to students and ask them how their experience is. But, you know, um, but I do think like, you've got to think like a consumer here again, you know, because we're looking for the best match for your student. And so you don't just want to go on the campus tour and leave. I really think some wandering is super important. In addition, I would suggest that you do a drive around the area like well okay so this is my college where I'm going to live, but like what else is around here what's the transportation to here how many flights does it take how far am I from a major city. Where's Target? Where's the movie theater? You know, whatever it is that you care about, um, I think you want to kind of know that um, so I know that and i've done this too, so you know we want to be efficient and get as many in as possible don't try to do more than two a day, please. You're gonna, you're gonna all just dislike each other when this is over. And a college tour is also this great chance, you know, I'm a mom of two grown adults now. And those, those trips are so much fun just for the wacky things you run into and the people you meet. Like give yourself enough space to enjoy this because it is a moment with your student that you only do once and, and it's fun. So don't get it so packed. A few places that I think you might want to consider visiting other than just um, those things. If a student has a learning disability, visit the disability support office, really important. I want you to see how comfortable you feel there. Is it at the furthest place on the end of campus around the corner and in the basement? That just told you how important that is to them. Um, if the student needs to, it thinks they may want to use mental health services. I think that's important to stop there. I love to stop at the Career Center. I think, you know, yes, you are going to college, but we hope that you're going to get out and get a job. How supportive are they going to be? Is it just here dial into a computer or is it actually people who can help you? Athletic facilities, international programs, study abroad, and you can't leave without going to the bookstore, right? So, um, you know, I think that is really important. When it's all done, jot down notes. We've made a little tour evaluation card, which I think can be helpful. You don't have to use that. I tell students, you know, their phones are great things to just put notes in, but you may be visiting a number of campuses and this is what happens so often as students say to me, oh, I can't remember. You just paid all this money to go on this trip. So make sure that you guys have figured out a reasonable way to document which should be led by the student because they're going to college, okay? So I encourage you to make sure that you're actually evaluating the school. And that's your campus tour. Great. So um, let's just dive into what demonstrated interest is. I think a lot of people have heard the terminology and they're like, what does this mean? How do I do this? One more thing to add to the process. 
Um, so basically, demonstrated interest is, as Lisa has explained, is your way to show colleges that you're interested in them. But I think a lot of times that information can feel disconnected because you're like, well, why does a college care about that? Why do they care if I'm interested? I've applied, right? Doesn't that show enough interest? And the reality is, is that colleges are businesses and they have an obligation to bring in a class every single year because every college has budgets uh, and they have to meet that minimum budget. If a school fails to make their class, something's getting cut on campus. Okay, so that's kind of uh, the environment you're in. And if you over enroll, you know, then that's another, you know, can of worms that schools face because then your classes get bigger. So let's talk a little bit more deeply about demonstrated interest. I mean, we can definitely see that this is starting to have a lot more impact in particular as the pandemic has really played a role in shaping what is happening with admissions. And so what we mean by that is that colleges are honing in on this because they know that it's become a little bit harder for folks to visit schools. They know it's been a little bit tougher before they were able to do all these virtual visits and campus tours virtually for people to feel connected to their campus. And that was impacting the number of students that were actually enrolling. And so this is part of the reason why schools are starting to lean into this because as students are applying to more schools, you really don't know as a college or a university whether or not that student is taking you seriously. So this is why we actually kind of have like a plan of action for you. Um, but I want you to kind of take a moment and see the next slide of how sophisticated these systems are. So uh, admissions professionals have a couple of different ways in which they track interest. And so they've developed really sophisticated tools. Uh, a couple of the tools will be like Slate or Workday, which are uh, these management systems to help them track all the information that's happening. But as you can see in this slide, they can see when you open email from them. They can see how long you've stayed on this page. They know if you've clicked on any links that are embedded in that email, okay? So it's really important to be able to uh, understand what the role is. And demonstrated interest is used in a couple of different ways. So in this case, one is to track interest. And in some places, it does count quite a bit for whether or not a student is admitted or denied from a particular school. In another sense, it's marketing. Where do they want to invest those dollars to encourage more students to continue an interest in their school? But for you as a student, it's important that you're letting them know these things and that you join the official mailing list. So here you can see pretty clearly that there is an admissions funnel. So telling you a little bit about my years in admissions is that there is definitely a funnel. So colleges and universities would buy names from the college board and ACT. So, or, you know, when you shared your information, when you did your AP exam, you shared your information when you signed up uh, to do the SAT test, the ACT test, maybe you did the PSAT so you can qualify for um, the scholarship program that's affiliated with the, the PSAT. And so colleges take that and they're like, we're gonna buy 50,000 names as an example. Okay, so that's a lot of names. You were, you're probably thinking, why does a college need to buy so many names? And they do so, because they know that they're not going to get every single student interested in their school. And those names may follow a parameter. Maybe this is a school that wants students from all 50 states. Maybe this is a school that's trying to get more men into nursing. Maybe it's a school that's trying to see more women in engineering. So there's a lot of different things that are being part, that's part of this calculus that colleges are trying to get to create their ultimate community. So your job is to help them understand that you've done your homework on this school. So you're going to flip yourself from a prospect to an inquiry. And as an inquiry, you're going to inquire, okay? You're going to be curious about the schools that you're interested in. So step one, join those mailing lists, okay? You, that's how you initiate that contact. That's how they know a little bit more about you. Or if they're sending you email or mail, it means that they are already reaching out to you and you need to respond to them. Okay, so that's a way to do it, okay? 
once you're starting to build yourself as an inquiry, the way it plays a role in the application process is actually you can see on this slide in that middle image, they talk about you, admissions people do, and the level of engagement you have with that school. So that when it comes to the time of application, they want to know if you really know this school. And the only way you can really do that and show that is through this tracking process of demonstrated interest. Do the tour, make sure they know you did the tour. Do online sessions, where, whether you have an opportunity to chat with students, whether you join an online campus tour, all of those are touch points because if you notice, and you will begin to notice if you haven't already done this, they always ask you to register in advance. One is for crowd control and two is so they can collect your information. Okay, so it's really sophisticated and it's not anything against you, right? They're not out to get you. They're not trying to ding you in this process. They just really wanna make sure that the students they accept are students who really wanna be there because they know that you have choices. You're great students, you've been doing a lot of great work. So you wanna make sure that they know that. So they'll rate your engagement level and that can play a role in the admissions process, okay? So we've been hitting upon these points of why demonstrated interest is important. You know, but on the flip side of you communicating to them that this is important, that you care about this school, you're actually doing a lot of homework that's going to serve you well, okay? You're gonna learn whether or not these schools are places that will be a good match for you. Is it, as Michael has already pointed out, is it the right learning environment? Is it the right type of education you're looking for? What kind of class experience do you want? So all of that is homework that could feed into your future work about the school. The other place where we can see demonstrated interest sort of begin to seep into is um, whether or not you have written those supplemental essays. Um, and those supplemental essays, if you're doing your research at the front end, when it comes time to apply, you can pull all that knowledge and take it with you and apply it into that why this school essay. And you already know. It's not a secret. You've already done it. So that's the importance of being able to do that. So we're each gauging one another for fit. Colleges are gauging you for fit. You're gauging the college for fit. It's a two-way street. So examples of demonstrated interest. Okay. So in pre-pandemic times, which now feels like a million years ago, I feel like this is a journey through time. <laughs> so in pre-pandemics, colleges and universities would come to your school and visit, and they would give you a 45-minute presentation, and they tell you a little bit about the school, and you could actually meet these mythical creatures in person, okay? And in reality, you can still do that. That's still happening at some level, but it's gotten a little tougher as the rules and regulations around the pandemic have been sort of in motion, okay? So what you can do for yourself is engage online. Go to the websites, and that same place you go to for campus tours and you have to register, they're also asking you to join the mailing list. So that's how you get into a virtual information session. All the virtual contact counts. Okay, so do the information session, do the virtual tour. Some colleges have gotten really great about having live student panels so you can ask students questions directly, which has been really helpful for a lot of students who can't visit. Um, I also think that that's really been a wonderful asset, the silver lining of this pandemic, because sometimes on a college campus, students are so busy, it can be pretty hard to just have a conversation with folks. So. If you're able to do those touch points, wonderful. If you're able to go in person, you know, there are so many different things that you can do in person on that campus from visiting a particular department. Uh, interviews are a way that a lot of students can engage in demonstrated interest. And I think that that also can make a big difference. And sort of the list kind of goes on from the types of contact. If you're an athlete, reach out to your coach. If you're a musician, make sure you're talking to the folks who do concerts, okay? If you are really, really excited about a particular academic area, go to that department and find out more, okay? So we really wanna make sure that we do that. Um, 
and I just saw a question that I'll answer live. So we just received a question about how do you find information on the regional contact? And it's a great question. Many admissions offices actually have links on their admissions white websites that might say something to the effect of meet the team or come and see who is from your area. So most admissions offices do like to manage the different areas because most colleges and universities like to have specialists of certain territories. So there will be a Texas specialist and there'll be a California specialist, there'll be an Iowa specialist, okay? Because they wanna understand the context of what is happening in that area. So it's actually pretty easy. If you have a hard time finding it online, it's okay. Most campuses still have like these things called phones that you can pick up and give them a call, which is fantastic, you know, because sometimes getting buried in a website is just very inefficient and you don't have time to do a search in that way. So just pick up the phone and folks are really happy to help you. Um, and some schools have regional centers in different cities where they might have a lot of applicants where you can connect directly with those schools. So I think for our students, I, I love this because they've made themselves more accessible in a lot of ways. Um, and admissions people are nice. I, I used to be one, so I like to say that I was nice. But also, in general, admissions folks are really nice and they really wanna help you in this process, okay? Now, best for you, be polite, okay? You don't wanna be the stalker that admissions people talk about because after the fair, you follow them to the bathroom still asking questions, okay? Don't be that student, okay? Be considerate of the representative's time and just always be curious, okay? If you don't get your questions answered in that moment, it's okay, you can email them later, okay? And finally, mistakes. It happens, we all make mistakes and it's okay. But if we can avoid them, that would be fantastic and the rest of the team can feel free to jump in on here. But you don't want to only show interest in your top schools, okay? I think that's the biggest mistake I've seen. Um, your REACH schools and particularly the Ivies don't care <laughs> if you have demonstrated interest or not, okay? Because they have sufficient applicants. Make sure you're showing a little love to everybody on your list. Okay, um, I think that can be really helpful. Um, Lisa had already mentioned not attending an official tour. If you're going to be on campus, try to make sure the admissions office knows you're there. And sometimes you can also uh, share that you were on campus if it's part of a component of your essay or the application. But if you want to keep it nice and tight, make sure it's being tracked in some way. Okay. Students. Yeah. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. And I think that is so important is that you that you do make sure that that happens. I would say, you know, two things that Claudia mentioned here that we probably didn't. One thing I want to tie back from what Bob was talking about at the very beginning was that, you know, your reach, your possible and your matches. I just want to make sure y'all heard what Claudia said. The number one mistake we see is we're going to visit colleges. Great. Where are you going? We're going to Harvard, Yale, and Princeton. Those are great schools, fantastic. What else are you gonna be seeing? That's all, that's a bad idea. Harvard, Yale, and Princeton are a reach for every student, no matter what, no matter how great they are, their acceptance rates are too low not to be seen as a reach for everyone. So your, if you go back to Bob's slide about the how the college, you know, your balanced college list, I would like to advocate that what Claudia is really saying is you need a block, balanced, tour list. And this is the number one mistake that we're seeing. So what is your balanced tour plan? And as parents, I really encourage you to have equal interest in all those colleges, because I think um, students tend to understand how competitive this process is by the time they get into it, because they've heard from friends. I think as adults, it's sometimes if you're not in this every day, it's hard to realize how competitive this is. And the, I'll just do the last two here is that um, it is important that students are the people communicating with colleges rather than parents. Now, there are certainly exceptions. Your student can't call during the day to arrange something that you guys might need to arrange. Totally appropriate. But if it is about the interest in the college, it is going to be so much better for the student 
And remember that we're talking about students thriving in college ultimately. And one step to that is to give them agency in this process. The final thing is the human element piece. You know, try to get to know the, you know, talk to people, get to know people. Don't forget that there is a human element to this. It's like Claudia said, she was in admissions for, you know, almost 20 years. She's lovely, she's approachable. It's just that sometimes our friends in admissions get tired when the people are chasing them around, you know, like it just kind of goes overboard. So those are really important things. Now, the final topic I wanna to talk about is how parents can help, because I think parents are a critical part of the college tour process and the college admissions process. And it's this, you know, the parent role in tours is not without its challenges. One of the things, as I said, is to be realistic on the colleges that you're, that you're visiting. I think this is so hard because we all know how fantastic our kids are. My kids are the greatest, they are. Like, I mean, honestly, so, and, and you should feel that way, but your job in this is to show some breadth. And one of the hardest things for a parent to ever do a little neutrality, because if we can be neutral, it gives the student a chance to, um, to come forth with exploration of their opinions about something they've never done before. Um, and take the students, um, on visits and participate, be involved together. I think it does help to do this as a family, I do. Um, college is a big expense. I always tell students it ultimately does have a family component because it's a whole lot of money. Um, hardest thing I'm gonna ask you to do, let your student react before you react. We all have so many fears about our student. Oh my gosh, what about this? What about that? Just hold it in, hold it in. You can talk later, but let the student react so that they, because they're still learning what they think about colleges. We've all been, many of us have been to college. We've had this experience. We have something context, if you will, that students don't have. And so when they're touring, they're gonna be moody. They're gonna be unsure. They're going to change their mind. And it really is important that, that they have the room to do that because that's how we push up against what's really going to work. Be honest about finances or deal breakers. If you're like, I hate this state. My child is not going to school in this state. Let's just go on and get it on the table. If you have X amount of money, that is actually fair. There is Money is a real part of life. And I don't think there is anything wrong about letting your student know this and it's actually as someone has been doing this for 15 years will solve a thousand problems if we just get straight about it at the beginning so there's a lot of colleges with differing price structures so it's important to know that up front so that you're not going out and falling in love and visiting a college you can never afford to attend years ago i wrote this little pledge um, when my students were going out on tours i'm sure it could be updated or whatever but step back and let your students take the lead. Remember that it's about your student, like whatever you wish you had done in your college is over. So it's not our time to live that through our students, even though it's tempting. Let the student try to get their ideas out. They're gonna say ridiculous things sometimes because they're trying to figure this out. I mean, I literally once had a girl come back and tell me that she wouldn't attend a college because it didn't have Coke, it had Pepsi in the machine. And so, I mean, they're going to say sometimes ridiculous things. And so just try to let that, um, try to let that roll a little bit if you can, I guess is what I'm saying. And finally, this is true for the whole college journey give up the expectation that the trip is going to be perfect. It's not. You're going to get lost. You're going to take a wrong turn. Someone's going to spill their drink on their blouse and not want to go in. I mean, like these things are going to happen. And so let this trip or whatever visits you do to colleges also be part of your parenting journey and, 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 and put, put the idea of it being perfect aside. And I think you'll have a much better experience. Our goal at the end of the day with campus tours, with your college list showing interest is all about one thing, for your student to have great options for college where they're going to thrive. It's about options. It's not about winning the golden ticket. Do you know, it really isn't. It's about having a broad set of options that match your student. And when you're going out to look at campuses, that's what you're looking for. 
Sadly, as I say to students all the time, there's no perfect partners, there's no perfect houses, and there are no perfect colleges. And if you're telling yourself that one college is perfect, you just haven't spent enough time there, probably. So broad options is what you're looking for. And hopefully, as you guys do these tours and explore colleges online and begin to do this together, students begin to think, oh, I'm seeing some things I like. Yeah, I'm, I'm starting to find some places that could really fit for me. We um, so appreciate everybody joining us today for this webinar. <clears throat> we will be sharing in the follow-up email tomorrow, both a, a link to the recording of this on YouTube and the materials, as well as the scorecard that Lisa mentioned. Um, please feel free to let us know if you have any questions in response to that email. And we hope that you and your students have a wonderful set of tours this spring and this summer.